Good morning, Bellevue family. It is so good to be back with you this morning. Um, there is just something about summer camp with your teenagers and staying up um, until 2, 3, or 4 a.m. every night that just makes you really excited to get back in here and worship with your family. Um, these kids are so excited to worship you this morning. So if you'll please stand and join us, um, we're going to get our, our morning worship started. let you know about. Um, first of all, as you can obviously tell, we are decorated and ready for VBS this week and uh, so excited about that and uh, really looking forward to the great opportunity uh, that we have going on there. And so what I want to do is just, again, take a few moments, welcome each and every one of you. We're so glad to have you with us today. And if you're our guest, we would love for you to go and uh, fill out a connect card in the foyer and so that we can get to know you better and continue to serve you and your family uh, in a way that would be uh, more beneficial. So we're so glad to, to see you all here again today. And again, if you will fill out one of those connect cards, we'd love to give you a, uh, a Bellevue coffee mug and all kinds of other little goodies as well. Um, first of all, again, speaking of VBS, I have a couple things we need you to know about. There will be a meeting following church today in the chapel, and we need every volunteer who is helping out with VBS to be there. Uh, it is incredibly important. If you can be there, we need you. 
uh, to be there at that meeting today in the chapel uh, as we're just going over a few quick things for tomorrow night and this week. And uh, again, just so looking forward to that opportunity. Also, a couple of other quick things I want you to know about. Uh, there have been questions about the softball game tomorrow night. If you are not helping out at VBS and are on the softball team, we would still love for you to be there. Now, granted, there is a chance that it might get rained out. I don't know. Uh, but again, we're going to try to do that if, um, if we have the people and the weather permits. So if you're not in VBS, but you're playing softball, we'll still like to see you there as well. Uh, also, I want to share with you about Run for Glory for just a minute. Uh, we are still in desperate need of volunteers, waters, and Gatorades. And uh, so if you can help out with any of those things, please let us know. Um, I was speaking with Charity this morning. We still have quite a few needs, and so I uh, wanted you to know about that. If you can help out, uh, we need to know so that we can kind of put, put you where we need you and those sorts of things. So uh, help us out with that. Also, if you want to sign up for the race, the last day that you can do that and get a T-shirt is Wednesday. And uh, the same is true if you're interested in doing a sponsorship. If you're interested in uh, providing sponsorship for that, it needs to be done by Wednesday. So if you can do that, uh, that would be super helpful for us. And also, uh, too, there's a question about if you are interested in donating but don't want to run or buy a T-shirt, uh, you can do that still at the same site that they have for the sign-ups, which is runsignup.com. So check that out. Also, one quick little thing that I want to share with you that is coming up is, is two events that we are going to be partnering uh, with the Etowah Baptist Association to take part in. And this is part of our Gospel for Our Neighborhood initiative. And so what we're trying to do is it is a... Um, a, a association-wide goal uh, of having 25,000 uh, gospel conversations over the month of September. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be doing some things here that will be very specifically targeted toward uh, reaching people in our neighborhoods. But one of the things that I uh, want to share with you about is we're having two events to prepare for that. The first one is on August the 16th. It's a Monday night at First Baptist. And uh, what it will be is a night of prayer and, and kind of preparation. What we're going to be doing is praying over our community. Uh, we're going to have some uh, challenging and encouraging uh, messages that will be shared with us. One of the speakers is Dr. Don Whitney, who is just uh, excellent. Uh, love for you to come be a part of that and, and get to, uh, again, experience that. It's August 16th, a time of prayer and preparation for our uh, um, our gospel sharing initiative there. And then also August the 29th will be our uh, Gospel for Our Neighborhood kickoff rally. Uh, that is at Southside Baptist Church, and the speaker that night will be Shane Pruitt. I don't know if you guys are active on Instagram or anything like that, but Shane Pruitt is definitely someone you should follow on there if you are, uh, as he is just posting all kinds of good stuff lately. Fa fantastic and excellent truths. Uh, works for NAM, uh, the North American Mission Board, and, and the Next Gen Ministry. So uh, check out all of those things, and if you're interested in any of that, or you want more information, just let us know, and uh, we'll get it situated for you. But uh, if nothing else, what we're going to do real quick is just take a moment of prayer to pray over VBS uh, this week and also the rest of our service. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you today, and Lord, we are so thankful for your grace and your mercy. Father, we come before you today, Lord, thanking you so much for uh, your answering prayers, Lord. Last week, we, we came, and Lord, we asked for you to do a mighty work at the youth camp, Lord, and to bring them back safely to us. And uh, by all accounts, Lord, it seems as though you have truly answered that prayer. And so, Father, we praise you for that this morning. Lord, we also praise you for another opportunity to be able to come into this place and worship together today, Lord, in truth and, and in the spirit. And so, Father, we pray that as we're doing that today, that, Father, you would just bless our services, that, Father, you would just help us that everything we do and everything we say would be for your honor and your glory and that, Lord, you would be pleased with it. Father, we come praying today for this week of Vacation Bible School, Lord. We pray for the volunteers and the teachers and the leaders, and Lord, that you would just give them the energy and the strength and the wisdom and the, and the words to speak to share the gospel with these children. Father, we pray that uh, as we are doing this, that Lord, you would just help us to bear fruit. That Father, we would see children come to know and place their trust in you. And Father, that we would just have a great week of worshiping you and uh, ministering to these kids and their families. Lord, we just pray that again that you would bless us, be with us today again, that everything we do and say, it would be done in your name. And Father, again, that you would be pleased. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Will you please stand and join us again as we worship? Um, this song that we're doing is um, exciting to me because it's something our youth did multiple times over this week um, in our services, in our worship time. So will you loudly proclaim those truths back to them as they proclaim them to you?
good to be with you this morning. I'm so excited to uh, uh, continue to walk through the Word with you. Uh, I'll share with you a couple of quick things this morning. I'm so excited that today we are going to uh, look at the VBS text that we'll be using, but we're going to look at it in the larger context. So if you want to go ahead and be turning in your Bibles to Jeremiah 29, verses 4 through 14. Again, that is Jeremiah 29, 4 through 14. And we're going to be looking at that, but I just want to share a moment and kind of tell you a little bit about where we're going and, and preview uh, some of the upcoming uh, sermons and messages and places where we're going to be. Uh, over the next two weeks uh, after this, we're going to be looking at the book of Philemon. Now, I shared with you uh, a while back about how Philemon and Colossians are, are tied together so intimately. And so uh, after praying over it and, and looking at planning out the rest of the preaching calendar for the remainder of the year, uh, we're going to look at those uh, two. We're going to do two sermons out of the book of Philemon over the next two weeks. And then uh, just go ahead and tell you that we're getting ready for... Um, kind of our one of our fall series will be in the book of Haggai so if you haven't checked that out I encourage you go go check both of those books out and, and begin reading through them and and praying over uh, what the Lord would tell you as you as we work through those together but today what we're doing again is we're looking at this passage and and the way that it works is, is we're really going to be talking a lot about God's plan now, we all know Jeremiah 29, 11, I would imagine, just about by heart. It's a famous verse that, that many of us will uh, um, be able to probably quote. It's something that many of us maybe have as a, as a decoration or a bracelet or a, or a life verse in a sense. Because it's a comforting verse. It, it reminds us that God does have a plan. But see, here's the thing. We talk about God's plan a lot in a, in a very abstract sense. For instance, how often do we invoke God's plan in our life whenever something difficult comes along, right? Uh, something, whether it's mildly inconvenient, such as uh, having a flat tire, or maybe it's something majorly life-changing, such as a difficult uh, medical diagnosis, or, or the loss of a loved one, or something tragic. And we'll say things like, oh, God has a plan. But what we need to remember, and, and what I would just encourage you to think about today, is that when we talk about God's plan, I, I think the, the, the best description of it is in Romans 8, where he says he, 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 all the, he has a plan for those who are called according to his purposes, right? He makes it work out for their good. 
And the way that we describe this theologically is that God's plan always works out for his glory and our good. But what so often happens is that we think that it should be that God's plan works out for our glory and our good. See, we want both. We, we like to think that when we say that God has a plan, that it means that God's going to give us whatever we want or bless us with whatever we want and that nothing can stop us. But God's plan means that everything works out again for his glory and our good. Not our wants or our wishes, but our good. And so what we're going to do today in this verse, the way that we're going to look at it and outline it, is that we are going to look at how we are to live in light of the Lord's plan. How do we live in light of the Lord's plan? And what can this passage from Jeremiah uh, teach us today? So let's look at the passage together, and then uh, we will pray and, and make some application together. Beginning in verse 4, I'm reading from the New King James. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, After seventy years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you, and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we come before you again today, and Lord, we just pray that you would uh, bless this time together. Father, you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts that we may see and hear and understand. Father, help us to see and understand your word so clearly today. Lord, we pray that you would just reveal yourself to us, that Lord, by knowing more of who you are, we would love you more deeply and we would follow you more closely. Father, I pray that you would move me out of the way, use me as a simple vessel to proclaim your message. Father, may we take that message and apply it to our hearts today. Lord, give us the strength, the courage, and the conviction that we need in this place. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, y'all going to have to forgive me if I'm moving around a little freely today without the pulpit in front of me. A pulpit's like a preacher's recliner. Uh, it really is a, a place of, of comfort when you have a good one. And so uh, y'all just have to bear with me if I'm moving around or looking a little awkward today. But... I'll tell you this, the beauty of God's word in this passage to me is is amazing. This is such an encouraging passage, and it's one that that should teach us a lot about how, again, to live in light of God's plan and what he's done. Jeremiah is someone who we often think of as the weeping prophet, right? He's a guy who preached for, as we think of, famously 40 years with no converts, that's what we think about when we hear of Jeremiah, the, this guy who, who is sad and, and, and kind of down. But really, Jeremiah here is, is proclaiming a message of great hope, a message of great truth. Now, it wasn't exactly what the captives in Babylon wanted to hear, but it was encouraging, and it should be for us as well. This part of the book of Jeremiah is found in chapter 29, and what it is is it's a letter from Jeremiah who has remained in Jerusalem to the exiles who were taken to Babylon. And what he's doing is he's sharing the word of God with them because he's heard some things and and mainly and most importantly because God told him to. But because he's, he's correcting an attitude that they have because they're not living rightly in the way that God would have them to live as people who are following his plan. And so what I want to show you today is from Jeremiah's correction of them and from God's encouragement to these people of how they should live, how we can live in light of his plan. Four things. Firstly, we need to remember from verse 4 that it is God's plan. Now, we might have skipped over this, but verse 4 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, 
Does anybody notice anything interesting in there? God caused it. He said, I have caused. What we are quick to do is to forget that when things happen, that it, it is God's plan. We're quick to place blame a lot of times when something happens, specifically something that we don't like. We're quick to place blame on the enemy, right? Or the devil or his demons in the sense that we'll blame the devil or his demons for coming against us rather than realizing that God might be correcting us and that we might have done something wrong. You ever had that happen? Right? People will, will be living in the midst of, of dramatic and unrepentant sin. Something will go wrong in their life. There will be a consequence of that sin. And then they will be quick to say, well, well the devil is just rising up against me. Well, we need to remember that in this, there, we still, as we talked about last week, have a holy God whom we are, are in a relationship with. Not everything bad that happens in your life is the enemy trying to knock you down. And we need to realize that for these captives who Jeremiah is writing to, being sent to Babylon was awful. It, it, was, it was terrible. It was defeating. They felt like their whole entire life had been uprooted. And you can imagine if a conquering army came into your town and your home and they ripped your family out of your home and the place that you had been your entire life and carried you away to a foreign land and you had to speak a new language and learn new customs do new things, how difficult would that be? It'd be awful. And that's what these people are dealing with, and so they're thinking about this, and it's, it's an awful thing, but what they have to remember, and what the first thing Jeremiah tells them is, is that God caused this, and it was in response to their sin. Now, what we need to realize is it was corrective, but God did send them there. It's so like I said in the intro, God will sometimes send us into things that are designed for our ultimate benefit and not our immediate comfort. Our ultimate benefit rather than our immediate comfort. You see, again, when we think about God's plan, what we think is, I want this to be over as quickly as possible. You see, we kind of treat every little inconvenience in our life as if it is a, a trip to the dentist office. Get me out of here as quickly as possible and as painlessly as possible. That's, that's our mindset. That's the way that we approach life. But in, in reality, what we need to recognize is that sometimes our ultimate benefit is to sit in the chair a little longer. Sometimes our ultimate benefit is more important than our immediate comfort. We can do some things to get some relief in life, but those things might not be what we best need. And so again, when we think about that passage where God says he's working everything out for our good, we have to realize that again is our ultimate good. Not just what we think feels good or would be the best thing for us in the moment. Here's the, the truth of it, guys, when we think about God's plan. It, it, it's not always to fix everything the way that we want it. Uh, just recently in my hometown, there was a, a man who was there who was in his 30s. And uh, they found prostate cancer the size of a grapefruit. In his 30s. Uh, this was a guy who was a, a veteran. He was a believer. He was just a genuinely solid guy, well-liked, well-respected. And he, he battled it for a while. Right? He, he, at times, they thought that he had overcome it. But it came back, and, and eventually, after a long time of battling it, he, he told one of his family members, who's a pastor friend of mine, he said, it's easy to give God the glory when he heals you. But that his goal was to be one who gave glory to God when God didn't heal him. Man, that's trusting God's plan. It's trusting his goodness. It's giving him glory even when things are difficult and when we feel like it would definitely be easier to not have to deal with these sorts of things. It's kind of like the guys in the fiery furnace. You remember back from Brandon's sermon a month or so ago? He said, God's able to save us, but even if he doesn't, we're still going to praise him and he's still good. You see, the course of their life had nothing to do with the goodness of God's plan because they knew that it was still good. It was still praiseworthy. It was still God. And we need to remember that when things are uncomfortable and when they're awful and when they seem terrible, God still has a plan. He is in control, and that should comfort us. 
But it doesn't always mean that there's immediate relief right around the corner. What it means is that we have a loving God who is, is able to sustain us when we are going through those things. It means that we have a, a, a loving God who, who is near and close to us, who promises his presence, who promises his strength when we're weak. So we realize even if it doesn't work out the way we want it to, we aren't going to stop praising him, and he is still good. See, the beautiful thing about God's plan for us as believers is that we know that whatever happens is uh, if something difficult comes along, a storm, right? I had a mentor who explained it this way. He said there's two types of storms in the life of a believer. There's a storm of perfection and a storm of correction. Now, we recognize that God doesn't punish us for sin anymore. Now, he allows the consequences to come from it, but he punished Christ for our sin, the fullness of it. And so when, when we, something bad happens, we need to recognize it could be a consequence of sin. But if it's a storm from God, it's, it's designed either to perfect us or correct us. And that means it's either to sanctify us or to help us to, to grow past and beyond some sin. And so as we're thinking about that, we need to remember that, that God's plan is ultimately about sanctifying us and making us better disciples. And so what we need to start doing is looking in every opportunity, in every situation, how can this make me a better disciple? For instance, if you're in a situation where you're dealing with things that really try your patience, it could be an opportunity for you to learn some patience. If you're dealing with, with someone that it just takes all the grace and mercy you can muster up to deal with that person, it could be an exercise of learning to show more grace and mercy. If you're in a place where you feel like you're truly having to seek and find, and you feel like you're trying to find the truth of things, it could be something pointing you into the Word for deeper study. My point is, is in every situation, if we remember that God's plan is about sanctifying believers and making us better disciples, then we should look for the learning moment in everything. In every situation, recognizing that, that God is trying to push us into being better disciples. We know that whatever comes our way is in his will. We can be secure in knowing that his plan is better than our plan. The ultimate beauty about it being God's plan is that it is God's plan. Right? When, when I make a plan, there is also a plan B, C, D, E, F, G, Especially in ministry, we, we run under Murphy's Law. Whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. It happens, right? When we make plans, they, they often fall apart. And the Bible, again, shares that. When man has a way he thinks he ought to go, but those plans lead to death. We, we make these devices and these ideas, and, and, and the fact of the matter is that our plans aren't, aren't really that great. But God's plan is infinitely better. It's perfect, it's true, and it's good. And if his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, then how do we think that we know better? If he created this world and this universe and he, he put it together in the way that it needs to be, then how could our plan be better than what he's created? How could our plan, with our limited knowledge, be better than the perfect plan of a God with infinite and total knowledge? If he created everything, then he writes the owner's manual. He knows what makes us tick. He knows what we need. He knows the conditions in which we will best grow and best worship. And so what we need to do, first and foremost, if we are going to live as people who, who recognize his plan and live in a way that he would call us to, is to trust that plan. And remember that it's his plan and not ours. The second way that we live in light of the Lord's plan is, number two, to live for God where he puts you. We see this in verses 5 through 7 where he says, Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. Why does God here start by telling them to build houses and to live in them? Basically, what these people were doing, these captives, is, is they built tents and temporary little lean-tos and shacks and, 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 and these temporary dwellings because they thought that they would be out quickly. They said, we are God's people. 
Surely he will deliver us from this captivity in a matter of days or weeks or whatever. We'll be out of here. There's no reason to put down roots. What does God say? He says, no. Get settled. I have put you there and you will remain there until my purposes are accomplished. So get settled. You see, for us to live in God's plan, we're going to have to get comfortable being in uncomfortable situations. We're going to have to get comfortable living amongst people that are different and disagree with us. That's ministry. It means being at home among a people that hate you and don't want anything to do with God. We are there. Now granted, we may not be captives in Babylon, but we live in a place that is still surrounded by godlessness and lostness. We live in a place where the people around us are hostile to our message. If you don't believe it, you haven't shared the gospel. People are hostile to the message. God may very well put you in an uncomfortable situation. And we need to remember that it, it, it's his plan is for his glory and our good, so we need to get settled. Live there among the people. Do life together is what it's talking about here. Plant your gardens, eat. Live your life. Grow your family. And what the word is essentially telling us here is, is don't stop living because you don't like where God has put you. Don't shut down. Don't shut off. But instead, live for the glory of God wherever he puts you. If God's put you somewhere, he's put you there for a purpose. If God sends you to Africa or Alaska or Algeria or the Alps, wherever you are, go and live for him. And if God has planted you here in Gadsden, live for him here at the scene station or the falls or downtown or at Walmart. Wherever he has put you, he has put you here for a purpose. And we need to live that out. No matter where we are or what our circumstances are, we're to live for him. And the cool thing is that God gives us ways to do that. But, but don't forget that, that again, God has, has, he's perfect. He has a perfect plan. Right? We look back at Esther and, and what did he say in Esther? He said, perhaps you were born for such a time as this. Here's the deal, guys. You were born now in this generation for a purpose. You're here in Gadsden, Alabama on this mountain for a purpose. There are people around you who are godless and lost and they need the gospel and they need to see it lived out. So guys, live for the glory of God right here where he's put you. But he shows us the ways to, to do that. How do we live for the glory of God amongst the people? Well, again, we live our life, but it also says here that God tells these captives to love their community. He says, love your community. And he shows us that by saying, seek the peace of the city where I've caused you to be carried away and pray for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. Have compassion on the lost. Love the community. If we're here in Gadsden, we better love it. Uh, I had a great aunt who used to tell me, love it like it's yours, because it is. Right? <laughs> you know, if you got something and you didn't necessarily really like it, she said, well, you better love it because it's yours now. You know, that's the idea, Right? Our city may not be perfect. Our town may not be perfect. Our church may not be perfect. Because if God has put us here, we need to love it because it's, it's where he's put us. And, and the Bible tells us here that, 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 again, we should have compassion on the lost. We should love the, the area and the community. But here's the thing. It's not just the physical beauty of the mountain, mountain or the cost of living or the school district. It means loving the people. And, guys, that's the hard part. The hard part is not loving the natural beauty. The hard part is, is loving people who are difficult and not always easily loved. The simplest and easiest way that we can love our community is to pray for them. The Bible tells us here, pray to the Lord for it. When was the last time that we actually prayed for our community? Most of the time, what, what we do is we'll pray for ourselves and our family and maybe our friends. But when was the last time we, we prayed for the peace of our community, that we prayed that our community would believe the gospel and that God would be pleased with them and that there, there would again be peace with them so there would be peace with us? The Bible says when there is, is peace with the community, then 
so too will we be. And that's important for us to think about here for a number of reasons. Again, think about who God is telling to pray for peace and who he's telling them to pray for. He is telling people who were gone in and physically and violently ripped from their homes and their country and carried into another land to pray for the people that had taken them captive and to pray for peace. It would be easy for them to pray for destruction, would it not? Lord, smite them. Wipe them out. Give them what they gave me. And and a lot of times that is our prayer toward our community as well, is it not, Lord? I hope they get what they got coming. I hope you give them what they deserve. I hope that you... (laughs) They, They hated the people. It's easy to pray for destruction. But if you love the people in the community, it's easy to pray for peace. God says, pray for your enemies and love them and pray for peace for them. As ultimately, the, the prayer for peace was, was, again, it was an exercise in understanding God's love. It was an exercise in understanding the gospel. And, and ultimately, the only way that we're going to have peace with the world is, is through the gospel. That's it. The Bible says that the world is at enmity with God. If we want peace, we need, we need to be serious about sharing the gospel. Because it's the only thing that's going to change warlike, hateful hearts. We need to saturate our community. If we, we can't say that we love our community if we're not willing to share the gospel with them. We can't. We can't say that we love our community if we're not praying for them. In fact, if the only thing that we do is, is talk bad about them and hope that they get what's coming, then in fact, we by definition hate our community. And that's not what we're called to. That's why we're doing things. That's why we're partnering with other churches to try to get the gospel out here in this neighborhood, in these areas, in these key and strategic places. Because it's important. The Bible doesn't stop there in this passage. It says if we're going to live in light of God's plan, not only do we need to live for the glory of God in our community and love it, but we also need to influence the culture, not the other way around. We see this in verses 8 and 9. If we're going to live in light of God's plan, then we need to recognize that it is God's plan for us to make disciples, not the other way around. What this means is is this. We see in verses 8 and 9, he says, uh, don't let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you or listen to the dreams which you cause to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. Some key things here. Number one, don't be deceived. If we're going to live in light of God's plan, then when something little comes along, we don't need to to be tempted to immediately just abandon everything that God has shown us and told us and that we know to to go out to what the world would tell us to do. And and again, this happens all the time by so-called cultural prophets. That, that what we'll do is that the moment that we're going through a difficult time, instead of turning to God's plan and to God's word, what we do is we turn to a quote on Facebook or we turn to a, a neighbor who might have some advice. And we completely abandon what we know to be God's truth. i share you one I saw the other day on, on the internet. Person who's a believer, talking about something that they saw in their house, scared of a ghost in their house, okay? All the advice is all of these things you can do to get rid of a ghost, and not one of it ever quoted the word of God. Bunch of believers. Now, you might ask, why am I sharing this story? Because in the moment when someone was afraid, instead of turning to God's plan and God's word, they turned to the advice of people. Well-intentioned people, right, supposedly. Believers, supposedly. But they didn't share the truth. They shared deception and lies. Stuff that was worthless. See, here's the thing, guys. We are either discipling culture or the culture is discipling you. We are either out there taking the battle to them or they're bringing it to us. 
And we are so content to be passive, to be in between, and to be neutral, and to hold the status quo, but there is none of that. It is an anti-biblical idea to think that we can just maintain and hold our own right here while the world continues to do whatever they want to do. We need to be growing in our discipleship and in our disciple-making, or we are probably being discipled by the world. Don't get caught up in the deceptions of the world and the shininess and the beauty of it and the, and the whatever. If we're going to live in light of God's plan, then we need to recognize we are called to take that plan and to share it with the world. But he says, not only not enough to, he says, don't be deceived, but then in verse 8, he says something a little strange. Second half of verse 8, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. What is this talking about? It says, don't be deceived. And also here, don't deceive yourself. Don't listen to these dreams that you're causing to be dreamed. And essentially what I, I believe this is saying from the interpretation of the text and wrestling with it is that what he's saying here is don't live in this fantasy world that, that you know, for them it was, oh, God's going to pull us out of here and we don't need to worry about it. We can just hate these people and do whatever we want to do. Don't live in this, in this fantasy world. Live here and now. God was essentially telling them to sober up from their fantasies. For us, we can understand the application of this is to not be led by dreams or feelings, but to be led by the word and the truth of God. We love to lie to ourselves. One of the uh, great short stories, one of the truest short stories I've ever read, is The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. I made it into a movie. I haven't seen it. But in the short story, it was about this man who lived a very, uh, well, mediocre life. He works an office job. His marriage is, is on the rocks. His car is very boring. He's not really happy or content with anything. And so what happens is, is the secret life of Walter Mitty is all of these, these dreams and these fantasies that he lives in all day long. For instance, he'll be sitting at his cubicle typing in, and, and next thing you know, he is on a ship sailing across the sea, and he's a pirate. That's a, just an illustration, but my point is, is that kind of thing. It's a series and sequence of daydreams, and that is his, his secret life. And in, in the book, it's, it's funny because he eventually learns to appreciate his normal life, but the whole idea is that it, he seemed like he was more of himself in this fantasy and in these dreams than he was in reality. We love to live in a fantasy because in that fantasy, we are God. In our fantasies, whatever we want happens. If I want a Ferrari, I'm driving a Ferrari. If I want to be a king, I am. If I want to be a pirate, I am. If I want to be an astronaut, on and on and on and on. In those kind of things, we think, well, that's easy. We recognize that's not real. But our fantasies about the way that our life should go are just as out there. We think, oh, you know, I, I, I should be doing this, right? I shouldn't have to deal with this difficult thing. And so we sit around and we dream about a world in which we're not dealing with something difficult and everything is perfect as we see it. In that moment, we're claiming that we know better than God. God says, don't live in a fantasy. Know that my plan is good and that I'm a better God than you could ever imagine to be. Don't, don't let your, your dreams or your culture or what the world would tell you to be, don't let that interfere with what my word tells you, which is that I have a plan and it's going to work out for your good. That's the lie of our fantasies, is that somehow what we want is better than what God is bringing to pass. It's not recognizing that there's nothing better than God's plan. He is perfect, and thus he makes perfect plans. The Bible says, don't be deceived, don't deceive yourself. And then he says, uh, these people who are telling you this, they are not sent by me. They might be claiming my name, but they are not sent by me. We need to realize, guys, that not everyone who comes to you in the name of godly wisdom is sharing godly wisdom. Make sure it aligns with the truth of God's word. So our job is to not be deceived and to not deceive ourselves and, and, and to, to trust everything by the word. 
And our job is to then take that back to the culture. Instead of, uh, of deceiving, we are to teach the truth. We're to follow those who speak the truth. Truth is the opposite of deception, and truth is beautiful. And the truth of the matter is that God has a plan. The truth of the matter is that God uh, is working things out for the good of those who are following him. The, the truth of the matter is that even in the difficult situations, we can be growing, we can be learning. God has a plan even in that. And so the fourth and final thing I want to show you is that we need to seek God and look for him in his plan. This is through verses 10 through 14. And I love the way the verse 10 starts. It says, After 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you. What does that mean? God says, I will keep my promise. He says, uh, you'll return. You'll be restored. And it's almost like, well, well, that for, therefore, because I know my plan, is what God is saying. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. And when you really get down into this and you, you translate it from the Hebrew and you look at it, what it says really is it's, it's a plan of peace and, and it's a plan that will bring about an expected end. Hope and future those words are a way of translating it, but really the, that idea of future, what is it other than, than, than what we hope for and what is expected by God? He says, I will bring it to an expected end. God says, I have a plan. I know what I'm doing. He knows and we don't. Here's the thing that's so hard about it, and, and I have oftentimes said that this is one of the most difficult things to apply to our life. And that is that we want to know the plans that God has for us. I, how many times have I, have I sat there and said, Lord, I know you've got a plan and I trust you, but I really would like to know what it is. Maybe you have found yourself in that same boat. I, I know you've got a plan and I know it's good and I know that everything is going to work out, but I can't see it right now and I would like to. And I've had to repent of that. Because his knowing is enough. His knowing that he has a plan, him having a plan, it is enough. I don't need to know. What I need to do is to be still and to know that he is God. That he's in control. That he has a plan. And the plan is laid out. That's what's so cool about this. Where it says he is a, a, a hope and a future, an expected end. The most beautiful thing for us as Christians is that we can read the end of the book. Which means we know how it turns out. We know the end result. Have you ever watched a, a recorded sports game? I hate it. I can't do it because I always know who's going to win. It invariably fails that someone will spoil it for me. Or I'll get a notification on my phone. But here's the thing about it. If I'm watching a college football game and my team is down but I know that they come back and win. I'm a lot less stressed out when they're down. I'm a lot less concerned when they fumble or when they throw an interception. I'm a lot less concerned when they get beat. Same is true when I'm watching a movie of a book I've read. Main character's down and you're like, oh, he's about to die, but then, oh wait, they made three more seasons after this. <laughs> right, you know he's gonna turn out all right. It's a lot less stressful because you know the end result. For us as believers, our life should be a lot less stressful because we know the end result. Which is that as believers, we are in eternity with Christ. Which is that at the end of human history will be a time where God will set up an eternal kingdom. From Genesis to Revelation, the entire course of human history, it's laid out, it follows God's plan. God fulfills his promises to the captives in Babylon and even beyond that. They were so focused on, on getting out of Babylon that they missed probably the greater promises of redemption that God has here. He, he not only had a plan to rescue the captives there, but he also had a plan to proclaim freedom to the captives through Christ. And, and here's what happens after verse 11. We, we so often stop reading there. These next few verses are, are equally as beautiful. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. 
not, not a point, not a, a deep thought where I'm going to linger, but I, I do want to just make this point for just a moment. How cool is it that God listens to us? I, I just think that that's cool. You'll call upon me and go and pray, and I will listen. Verse 13 says, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. He says, call out to me, I'll hear you, and you'll seek me and find me when you seek with all your heart. We're, we're, we hear that, though, and then, and then we immediately want to qualify. Well, how do I seek with all my heart? Because that's the kind of seeking that gets found. Here's what the Bible says about us in, in, in Romans 3, 10 through 20. It says, as is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, and together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since the law comes, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Romans there says, none seek God. None go before him. None are justified by works of the law. But here's the beautiful thing about it. We are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. So how do we seek God with all of our heart? We seek him by seeking Christ. Is it. We call upon him. We we cry out to God. We place our hope in Christ and and looking to the word and letting the Holy Spirit open our eyes and guide us to see God working in everything. Seek God by by putting your hope and faith in him and his word and let him reveal himself to you. But what so often happens is that we try to seek God on our own terms. God, if you're there, prove it. See God by calling out. That's what the Bible says. They called out, God heard him, then they sought him and found him. Call out to God and ask him to help you see. The Bible says, seek me and you shall find me. Seek him. Call out to him. Notice here, what does it say happens when we seek God, when the captives seek God? Restoration. Restoration. I'll restore you, I'll gather you from the nations. And to me, this is immediately reminiscent of Revelation, where God says he'll gather from the nations. Every tribe and tongue will bow down and worship. God says, I'll gather you from the nations, I'll restore you to fellowship. Guys, in our sin, we are led into captivity, but through the blood of Christ, when we seek God, we will find him and he will restore us. But here's the thing, though. It's not hard to see God if you actually look. It's easy to see him in everything because he makes everything come to pass. In the last four verses of our passage today, 10 through 14, God says, I will, or directly attributes an action to himself 12 times. I will do this. This will happen because I have said so. I will do this. 12 times in those four verses. God is active and moving, and he has a plan. And if we're seeking him, we'll begin to seek him in everything that happens. We'll see his hand of providence guiding us in each and every situation, how he brings things to pass. Seek him in everything, knowing that he's working and has a plan. Open your eyes to it. It's kind of like that FedEx arrow thing. Have you all ever seen that? You know, I'm talking about how FedEx in their logo has a hidden arrow. If you don't know it, go see it. Look it up. After church, go and Google it, and you'll see it or find a FedEx truck. But here's the thing. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Now I'm driving down the road, and I look at the FedEx logo, and hidden within the word FedEx is an arrow. And I don't see the word FedEx. I just see the arrow. It was there in plain sight all along, but I was blind to it. But after my eyes are opened, it's all I see. And the same is true with God's providence with his plan. When my eyes were blind to it, I didn't, I didn't understand that it was God working 
to make things come to pass. I didn't understand that it was God's blessing. I didn't understand that, that God taking me through a difficult time would, would prepare me for something down the line. I didn't understand why God moving me in a, one direction that I thought was very painful would actually turn out to be a big blessing. Here's the thing, guys. When our eyes are open, though, it becomes so easy to see it. God, if you're moving me, there has to be a purpose and a reason I'm going to trust you. Because we've seen him work from the beginning of history. You go and you read the Israelites, the Red Sea, the manna, all of the things that they needed and God provided. And he's been faithful to us as well. Here, here's the thing, guys. It's easy for us to feel like a captive. To feel like, like everything is awful and woe is me and to get down in the dumps and, and to say, whoa, God's either going to rescue me from me immediately or, or I'm, I, woe is me, it's so awful, no, no one cares. God doesn't care about me. And if you get in that place and you feel like a captive and you wonder how you could ever trust God and you wonder why God would allow bad things to happen, seek him and seek his will and his word and trust his plan. If you're lost and a captive to sin, follow the order of our text. Call out to God, throw in yourself on his mercy and he will help. He will open your eyes, reveal himself, and he will be found by you when you seek him by the grace of Jesus. The beautiful thing about God's plan is that it's not about what we want or what we wish. It's about what he will do, what he has purposed according to his good pleasure. Take comfort. God has a plan. And we live in that plan by remembering that it is his plan. We remember it by living for him wherever he puts us and whatever he puts us through. We influence the culture around us and share the gospel, reminding them that God has a plan. And we seek him in every area of our life, trusting that he will bring about the end he has promised. One final note of encouragement for you guys. The ratios and the math and all this stuff, the odds of one person fulfilling all of the prophecies that were made in the Old Testament, it's ridiculous. Multiple billions to one. And yet, Jesus Christ fulfilled every one of them. God promised a Messiah is coming. It begins in Genesis. And he came. And he did what he said he was going to do. The moral of the story is God will keep his word. Remember, he has a plan. He's got a plan for your life. Follow it. Seek his will. Trust his word. And let's live for him. Father, we come before you today, and Lord, we just pray that if there's someone here who is lost in the captivity of sin, that Lord, you would just... Lord, you would reveal yourself today. They would seek you and find you. Father, they would call upon your name. Lord, we come thanking you for those of us who have believed in you. Lord, who trust you, who have found you. Lord, by your grace and your revelation. Lord, we thank you that you do have a plan. And it's better than what we can think or imagine. Father, help us to, to love our community and to live for your glory right here. Father, help us to influence them, for, again, for your glory by the gospel, by praying, by living out gospel-centered lives. And Father, help us to see your hand of providence in each and everything that we do and each and everything that comes our way. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.